also a very warm welcome from my side. I'm very excited today to take uh, the chance to give you a presentation about pickling, hydrogen embrittlement and pickling inhibitors. So first, let's have a look on how our webinar today is structured. At the very first place, I want to give you a short technical uh, background about the basic fundamentals of pickling, of hydrogen formation and hydrogen embrittlement. Subsequently, we will cover pickling inhibitors, how they are used and how they are working in the pickling solution. Then subsequently, I want to um, introduce to you our newest development in this field, UniClean 5.1.1. And then followed, I want to show you how is it possible to evaluate pickling and pickling inhibitors. Therefore, I will introduce to you several uh, test methods and also show you some results comparing pickling and pickling inhibitors. And at the end of the presentation, we will have a short summary summarizing what was said during our webinar. Okay, so let's go. The very first chapter, as I said, the fundamentals of pickling, of a pretreatment, and the principles of hydrogen formation and hydrogen embrittlement. So in electroplating, in general, the purpose of pretreatment is to create a surface which is free of any contamination. This ensures that subsequent coating steps are successful. And since the contamination on parts can be very versatile, uh, pretreatment is a multi-step process, how we can see on the slide here. So essentially, we have four different process steps. Pretreatment starts with a soap cleaning step. This step is applied in order to remove organic residues on the part surface like oils or particles and dirt which is attached loose to the surface can be removed by this process step. The next step then is the pickling step. This is the main step to remove inorganic contamination like oxides and scales on top of the surface. The pickling step is then followed by an electrocleaning step. This step is supported by current and is done to do a fine polishing or fine removing of the remaining contamination on the surface. At the very last, we have an activation step, which is the last finish before the plating. It is done to ensure adhesion of any subsequent coating layer. As our title of the webinar already stated, today we want to focus on the pickling step. So, in general, the importance of pickling is often underestimated. This treatment removes impurities such as stains, inorganic contaminants, rust or scale from ferrous metals. If these contaminants stay on the surface and then get coated, these residues can cause several uh, issues during the plating. For example, poor conductivity, a lack of adhesion of the plating, and they can also be corrosion promoting. Therefore, these residues are very bad and we do have problems to meet our industry quality standards. In general, pickling baths are diluted mineral acids. The most common compound used here is hydrochloric acid but also often used is sulfuric acid. This pickling bath can be modified on different ways. There are a lot of products available on the market. For example, the properties can be influenced by using inhibitors, as what is the topic today, but there are also possibilities to improve the acid attack by using wetting agents but also, and also um, even additives to further strengthen the acid attack by adding accelerators. First, we want to have a look at what happens when our pickling acid gets in contact with our substrate. Basically, there are two reactions occurring. The first one, 
and for us desirable is the, act, the uh, reaction between the acid and the metal oxides on, the, on top of the steel substrate. The oxides are not only rust, but are in shape of different iron oxides. So we have wustite, magnetite, and hematite. And also they differ in their solubility in acid. The wustite, which is the closest to the steel substrate, is the easily soluble, and then we have magnetite and hematite. When the acid gets in contact with these uh, oxides, the reaction is always the same. As a result, we gain the metal salt and water. When then subsequently the acid reacts with the base material, we face a redox reaction. Here, the acid oxidizes the metal, the iron, and forms the metal salt and hydrogen. So let's have a deeper look on how pickling really happens. In the first step, we have the permeation of the acid. This scale layer or oxide layer on top of the steel substrate is very porous. So the acid penetrates through the cracks and pores and then gets easily to the more soluble uh, oxide layers um, on the steel substrate and then starts to dissolve them. Secondly, the scale layer loses the adhesion to the base material and is detached from the steel surface. This process is then supported by the formation of hydrogen. As I showed on the last slide, the reaction between the acid and the steel substrate forms hydrogen, which then, when it develops, promotes um, retaching the scale from the layer, from the steel substrate. However, we have to say that when we take a close look to this process, that the formation of hydrogen gas is only part of the truth. Because when we have a closer look, we see that in a preliminary stage, not hydrogen gas is formed, but atomic hydrogen which is absorbed at the metal surface. This atomic hydrogen is highly unstable and within parts of second, it's going to react further to reach a more stable condition. Here, there are three different options how this adsorbed hydrogen can further react. Let's have a look at them. First, we have an electrochemical recombination. Here we see that the adsorbed hydrogen on the steel substrate is reacting together with a hydroxynium ion, which is coming from the pickling acid, and one electron, which is coming from the redox reaction between the acid and the steel. As a result, molecular hydrogen is formed, H2, which then dissolves into the solution. The second possibility, and probably the most common and known one, is when the adsorbed hydrogen chemically recombines on the steel substrate. So when we have two adsorbed hydrogen atoms at the surface and they get in close range to another, they just recombine and form H2, which then diffuses into the solution. And now the third, and for us, problematic reaction and possibility how adsorbed hydrogen can be stabilized is the absorption of, the, uh, of hydrogen to the steel. So since hydrogen is a very small atom, it's able to penetrate into the steel and be absorbed, um, be absorbed by the uh, crystal lattice of the steel. So it diffuses into the base material. And we now, as a summary, see these three processes together. It, is, it can be clearly said that the first two reactions for sure happen by multiple times more often than the third reaction. However, in cases where we have a high 
hydrogen formation and therefore high amount of hydrogen diffusing into the base material. This can cause great problems, what we know as hydrogen embrittlement. So dealing with hydrogen embrittlement, let us take a closer look what happens to this hydrogen when it is, is uh, when it um, diffuses through the steel substrate and then can cause hydrogen embrittlement. So as I said, first the hydrogen is absorbed and then penetrates through the boundary of the steel and is into uh, and comes into the steel structure. Hydrogen is a very, very small atom. It's the smallest atom in our periodic system. So it is able to move through the metal lattice. And this is what it does. It actually not moves by coincidence, but it moves to specific um, locations in the, in the lattice. It enriches at ground, uh, grain boundaries and lattice defects because these locations are energetically most favorable for the atom. And still keep in mind that even absorbed, the absorbed hydrogen is still quite unstable and wants to get to a more stable condition as fast as possible. And this is actually what happens in the third step. So where hydrogen atoms are enriching in the grain boundaries and in the lattice defects, we see a recombination reactions where this atomic hydrogen reacts together to form molecular hydrogen. And this for sure causes internal stress in the steel substrate and embrittles the steel, which directly leads us to the phenomenon of hydrogen embrittlement. So in general, hydrogen embrittlement is a well-known phenomenon and it is the permanent loss of ductility in a metal or alloy caused by hydrogen in the steel in combination with stress which can either be applied internally or externally. But it is very important to say that the hydrogen embrittlement does not occur by coincidence or every time that, hydro that hydrogen penetrates into steel. Actually, there are three variables which need to interact to gain hydrogen induced cracking. The first one that, I, that we were discussing in the last slide is the source of hydrogen. Here we have our pickling process where due to the reaction between the acid and the steel substrate hydrogen uh, develops. The second condition which needs to be applied is the mechanical load. So either we have external or internal stress applied to the parts or even tensile stress. And also um, notches, for example, can be a point that leads to an extensive mechanical load. The third variable is the condition of the material. As well known, especially high strength materials are, um, are eager for hydrogen embrittlement. Here we say that tensile strength higher than 1000 Newton per square millimeters or fasteners with crates higher than 10.9 are in danger of hydrogen embrittlement. Moreover, materials with a limited toughness or defects like low steel purities or non-metallic inclusions can even enhance this problem. So now, how does hydrogen embrittlement look? Here we can see an SEM image of a fracture surface where we can see um, on the top left side also the little micropores where hydrogen uh, evolved. But you may guess where we see the hint of hydrogen embrittlement, where it could have started. And actually, you can see here, this is where the failure of the whole part began. Um, 
these intercrystalline cracks start at the grain boundaries of the steel and then they continue to grow until finally the part fails and then fractures. As I said, very important for hydrogen imprisonment is the source of hydrogen. And for sure, I think you are all aware, not only pickling is a producer of hydrogen during electroplating processes, but there are also other process steps which produce hydrogen. For example, electrocleaning if it's applied in cathodic mode. And I think because the industry is quite aware of this problem, this setup is used very rarely. Moreover, and more important, and unfortunately it cannot be uh, stopped, is the diffusion of hydrogen in the base material caused by electroplating. Because we are not able to run processes at current efficiencies of 100%. And therefore, the reaction and the development of hydrogen is a problem that we face there every time. Next, and also very important, is that hydrogen also develops during corrosion. Today, we just want to focus on the influence of pickling to this phenomenon. So discussing all the negative sides of hydrogen and pickling and hydrogen diffusion, uh, diffusion, we sure raise the question, is there a possibility to suppress, inhibit, or at least hamper these negative aspects of pickling? And this is why pickling inhibitors are used and are widely spread uh, for picklings. So in this chapter, I want to have a deeper look on the mechanisms of pickling inhibitors. And I want to introduce to you our latest development, UniClean 5.1.1. But before we go to the mechanisms, let's first have a look at another issue which may, came, uh, which may come up when we are using pickling solutions. So as I said, for pickling, we are using diluted mineral acids. And these acids are very aggressive to the base material. And in case of extended immersion times, there, this, aggressive uh, this aggressive acid can cause several problems. So for example, as you can see on this SEM pictures on the bottom, we can see on the left side the steel substrate before it was immersed into the pickling solution and on the right hand side after 15 minutes. And when we have a closer look, you can really see how the surface gets rough and this could pos uh, for sure could possibly cause defects in subsequent coating steps, like for example, dullness or later even problems with corrosion performance. So now let's have a look how pickling inhibitor, or pickling inhibitors work. So this is our situation at the very beginning. We have the pickling acid, we have the steel substrate and the scale and oxide layer on top of the substrate. At the very first, the reactions which we already discussed happen. So on the one hand side, the acid dissolves the oxides, but on the other hand side, also the acid already attacks the base material and develops hydrogen, which is on the one hand side diffusing into the solution, but on the other hand side, also into the base material. This reaction reaches its highest strength when the complete scale layer is removed. So then the acid has uh, the acid has the blank surface of steel and the reaction and therefore also the hydrogen diffusion into the base material is the worst so basically what pickling inhibitors do is that they form a protective inhibitor layer 
this inhibitor layer slows down the acid attack. Basically, this inhibitor compounds are adsorbed on the part surface and therefore they block the wave from, from the acid to the substrate, and therefore inhibit the reaction. So inhibitors act like barriers. So they protect the base material against extensive etching, overpickling, and also due to the limited amounts of reaction between acid and um, acid and uh, steel substrate, the hydrogen diffusion into the steel crystal lattice, and therefore they inhibit hydrogen embrittlement. Also, a very important point, which need to be stressed out, is that these inhibitors are very selective. So they inhibit and protect the steel surface, but they have no influence on the inorganic residues on the surface, the rust, the scale, or the oxides, and so on. So what happens is that the acid with full power dissolves the scale, and then as soon as there is blank steel substrate, which would get in contact with the acid, um, then the inhibitor takes over and protects the layer. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, our newest development in this field, which is UniClean 511. The product has many great advantages. For example, it minimizes the substrate attack, uh, substrate attack and if it effectively um, inhibits hydrogen diffusion into the base material. Moreover, very important for us was to create an environmental friendly formulation. So UniClean 511 is free of CMR compounds and free of oxidizers. From an operational point of view, UniClean 511 is made up between 0.3 and 1% in the acid. This is depending on the one hand side on the desired inhibition performance, but also on the concentration and therefore the strength of the acid. To further visualize how UniClean 511 performs, we have prepared for you two very short videos. The first one will be the immersion of two fasteners, how you can see on the slide already, into a solution just containing the diluted hydrochloric acid. Here you can see how the hydrogen develops due to the reaction between the base material and the acid. I will play it once again. So then you can have a look, closer look. So you can really see the gas bubbles forming and rising to the top of the solution. In comparison to that, I want to show you how the situation is when we add to this solution 1% of our new inhibitor, UniClean 511. Here you can see that there is no gas formation at all. So we do not have any, uh, we do not see any bubbles finally, which for sure ensures or shows how effective this inhibitor is.
Okay. Another example of how pickling inhibitors can contribute to the success of the whole surface finishing sequence is shown here. The very strong acid tends, in case of cast, uh, fastness, to attack the threads. And you can already see on the left side, where we have the solution without an additive, how the hills of the threads are like opening up and the steel structure gets rougher. In comparison or in contrast to that, the attack of these uh, threads is very minimized when we add our inhibitor. This effect even gets greater when we increase the time of pickling. Here we have what happens after 30 minutes. You can already see how the hills of the th threads really open up. And for sure, this could not only cause issues later during plating, but maybe also problems during corrosion testing or even, for example, for COF measurements. In comparison to that, again, even after 30 minutes, you see that the thread is fully intact when we add an inhibitor at a concentration of 1%. Okay, so videos and pictures are all very nice. For sure, more interesting is how can we compare and evaluate pickling and pickling inhibitors? Here I want to present to you at very first place, a very, very um, easy test, which is um, done to determine the etching rate and the base material attack of an acid. This test is in general a gravimetric determination of the base material loss. Procedure wise, you just need what is shown on the image. So we need a beaker. We need two screws, which are pre-cleaned. This is very important that these screws already were objected to a full pre-treatment cycle to be sure that the mass which we are weighing um, is not affected by any contamination attached. So it is very important to already get rid of scale and rust and so on. Then, before we start the test, these pre-cleaned screws are dried and weighed. Then the parts are immersed into the pickling solution for a specific time. After this test time, they are ejected from this pickling solution. They are dried and weighed again. So therefore, we measure the weight loss between uh, due, due to the immersion of the parts into the solution. And based on these values, there are two important factors which can be calculated. The etching rate and the inhibition effectiveness. First, let's have a look at the etching rate. This value standardizes the weight loss on the area, so that when you compare always the same test specimen, you have the same area, and therefore it's really easy to compare different pickling solutions. The unit is given in milligrams per square centimeters. The second and also important value here is the inhibition effectiveness. The inhibition effectiveness is standardized using the etching rate of uninhibited hydrochloric acid. So this value is giving you how effective, how good your inhibitor works. Therefore, in the first test, you need to, you need to measure the uninhibited hydrochloric acid, which is then used as a 
basis to calculate our effectiveness. Both of these values are specific for the etching time and the etched substrate, which was objected. And here we see results and comparison of different inhibitors. So you see on the diagram five different columns. These five different columns reflect the etching rates after three, five, 10, 15, and 30 minutes. I think it's clear that the weight loss per area increases with prolonging pickling time. You can really see that for non-inhibited pickling, the weight loss is really high. And when we are using different inhibitor products, we can reduce the, um, the loss or the, the aggressiveness of the acid by multiple times. Especially, especially Uniclean 511 delivers here excellent performance. How you can see on the right hand side where we have the table showing the inhibition effectiveness after five and after 10 minutes, you can see that Uniclean 511 inhibits 98% or more than 98% of the acid attack to the base material and therefore really effectively protects our steel substrate. The next important point I want to discuss today is how can hydrogen embrittlement be tested and be quantified? So in general, the methods or the, the, the test methods which are valuable for hydrogen embrittlement are in, the, in principle very similar. So the process flow is more or less every time the same. We use test pieces which have a specific hardness. Then they are put under tensile stress. And then a procedure is carried out for a specific time, which at the end leads to fracturing or cracking of the test specimen if there's a critical concentration of hydrogen and the percentage or the amount of broken test specimen is then evaluated um, for to, uh, to see how um, big the degree of hydrogen embrittlement was i today i want to have a deeper look in a standard test method um, following a DEAN norm, uh, which is called the searing test. And for the development of our inhibitor, this searing test was used as well. Okay, so this searing test is a tensile bending stress test. On the right-hand side, you can see the test device with two times 10 test positions. And on each side of this device, we have 10 samples. And 10 samples is one test series. The test specimen for this test are so-called C-rings, as you can see on the image in the middle of the slide. In general, there are three different hardnesses available. It is very important that the test specimen, which we are uh, testing, have a defined hardness in a very small range. And so there are special suppliers and special test specimens necessary. The test specimens that we have are coming in three different hardness classes, in low, medium, and high, ranging from 450 to 550 hardness wickers. The test process is quite easy. So first, 
the rings are objected for sure to a soap cleaner in order to get rid of any organic contamination which may be on the part. And after this, 10 of these C rings are immersed into the pickling solution that we want to investigate for a specific time here, five minutes. After these five minutes, the parts are rinsed and dried. And with a maximum transfer time of five minutes, they are mounted on this device. It's very important to keep this five minutes because as I said, hydrogen is a very small and uh, a very small atom which can move uh, freely through the uh, steel crystal lattice. Extended time leads that hydrogen moves to deeper spheres of the steel substrate and therefore we do not see the effect anymore of the hydrogen which directly was introduced into the material due to our pickling process. After the parts are mounted, this tensile bending stress test is observed for in total 12 hours and the evaluation is done by counting the amount of broken C-rings of these 10 test samples. A very interesting side fact is when we have a closer look at the hardnesses of the C-rings. So as I said, our test specimen ranged from 450 to 500 hardness vickers. But when we compare these hardnesses to the hardnesses that our fastness that we usually treat, um, then we can see that already the lowest hardness that is available to us is harder than fastness of grade 40.9. And when we go to our medium and high hardness searings, the difference between the reality and the test gets even bigger. However, this difference and this extremely high hardness is necessary to justify the results of this test. Because since it is not possible here to measure the original parts, the original fasteners, this test specimen with a very high hardness reassure that when they do not break under these conditions, that the real parts in the barrel do not break as well. So this is an indirect test method. Here we see the process flow of this test. It's quite easy. On the first picture on the left, you see the sample holder with two little sticks coming up. With these sticks, here our searing is mounted, as you can see on the second picture. And then with a wedge, which is driven from the top through the hole in front of the searing, ten, uh, bending stress is applied. And you can see that when you compare the second and the third picture, that the searing widens. And eventually, when we have a critical concentration of hydrogen inside the material, the uh, ring breaks often at the same place where the stress is the highest, as you can see on the very right picture. So first, since we have our three different hardness classes of the C-rings, what happens when we mount these C-rings in different hardness classes on the device without any chemical treatment? And as you would expect, you see that you see nothing. So as the diagram says, we have 0% of fractures for every hardness class we see for the low, medium, and high. And the reason for this is quite 
is quite easy to understand. At the very beginning, I was showing the diagram with the three variables which need to interact in order to uh, produce hydrogen-induced fractures. So here we have the right material condition. We have very high um, hardness for our searings. We have the mechanical load, so we applied tensile stress. But for sure, there's a lack of hydrogen. Since we have no chemical treatment, only two of the three variables are given, and therefore, we do not see any fractures in this case. This situation dramatically changes when we object our C-rings to a pickling solution. Here we have 18% hydrochloric acid objected for five minutes. On the diagram, you can see how the numbers changed. So when we look at the lowest hardness class, you can see that we do not have any fractures as well. So again, when we think of the diagram with the three variables here, we have the hydrogen source, we have the um, mechanical load, but obviously our steel condition, our steel hardness was not hard enough to have hydrogen induced imprisonment. This situation for sure changes when we go to higher hardnesses C-rings. So for the medium hardness C-rings, we see that after 12 hours testing time, more than half of the rings are broken. And for the highest hardness, 550 hardness vickers, you can see that already after 30 minutes of testing, all of the rings which were exposed to the test are broken. So these results say two things. On the first side, that on the first side, that the low hardness C-rings, they are not sensitive enough to see if we have critical hydrogen imprittlement. And the high hardness rings, they are too sensitive in this case. So what leaves us open is that we use the hardness, the rings with medium hardness of 500 H, uh, hardness vickers. They have the advantage that even when the situation gets worse, we will see it because then we will have higher numbers of fractures. But we can also see when the hydrogen diffusion is somehow inhibited that the numbers should decrease. And therefore, the following results you will see are all done with these medium hard rings, uh, this medium uh, hardness C rings. So for sure, now it's interesting what happens when we give an inhib inhibitor to the system. The diagram again shows the comparison between the uninhibited hydrochloric acid and our three inhibitors. In general, you can see that by applying an inhibitor, the numbers can already be reduced. However, it is important to say that in this comparison test, only Uniclean 511 was able to deliver a result where we do not have a critical concentration of hydrogen inside the material and therefore no fractures. So the product is able to fully inhibit hydrogen imprittlement in this case. So now the next and really interesting point, what happens when we have a look at the whole pre-treatment sequence? So let's start at the soak cleaning, then go to acid pickling and electro cleaning. All the steps done subsequently. For sure, first on the left side, you can see as expected for the non-inhibited hydrochloric acid that when we are using the soak cleaner, that we have no influence, uh, that we see no fractures, just because soak cleaning does not produce any hydrogen at all. So again, here we are miss uh, missing the availability of hydrogen. Then, as you could already see in the slides before, when we then go to the pickling step, 
we uh, end up at about half of the specimen broken. And this situation does not change when the electrocleaning step is processed uh, following the pickling step. Compared to this, what is when we add Uniclean 511 to this pickling bath? You can see for sure after soap cleaning the same results, but as expected, when we add the product to the pickling solution, we see zero fractures. And as well, after electro cleaning, there are no fractures visible. Therefore, by adding this product, we can ensure an hydrogen embrittlement free pretreatment with Uniclean 511. So let's finally summarize our findings and results for today. Generally, pickling is an essential step in pretreatment. Its influence on the success of the whole uh, process sequence is often underestimated. But often, when this pretreatment is done poorly, it could lead to defects in subsequent coating steps. Hydrogen embrittlement occurs by the interaction of three variables. First, the hydrogen source, then the mechanical load, and third, the condition of the material. Hydrogen embrittlement happens because atomic hydrogen, which is produced during the reaction between the acid and steel substrate, diffuses into the base materials and then recombines at crane boundaries and lattice defects and then brittles the steel. By the addition of inhibitors to, pick, to, to pickling baths, the acid attack is slowed down and the absorption of hydrogen in the steel crystal lattice is inhibited and suppressed. Inhibitors form a protective inhibitor layer which um, effectively guards and protects the steel substrate. Our latest development, Uniclean 511, delivers, as you saw by comparing, uh, by our comparing results, as you saw, deliver great performance as a pickling inhibitor. It effectively uh, minimizes the base material attack and inhibits hydrogen embrittlement. And it has, as I said, many great advantages. It is an env environmental friendly product and is easy to use as it is a concentrated liquid. Moreover, it is not wetted, so even for rework parts, we do not have extensive foaming. And um, we do not see any reduction in the effectivity of the pickling process, as well as for the case that you have to need to strip or rework zinc parts. Thank you, Pjörn. <clears throat> we will now proceed with our Q&A session. I would like to remind you that we will cover as many questions as possible during our Q&A session and all the rest will be answered by Pjörn after the webinar via email. Okay, let's start. First question. What is the type of pickling inhibitor, inhibitor organic or inorganic? Yeah, uh, so thank you for this question. This inhibitor is an organic material. Okay, next question. Can the pickling inhibitor be analyzed? Um, yeah, so there is a possibility to analyze this inhibitor, but this requires quite sophisticated um, anal uh, analysis. So it should not be used as a tool for the bath control. Thank you. Um, next question. Does the inhibitor affect plating bath if it is dragged in? Um, yeah, I think in, in general, we should, I think this is obvious that we should say that 
drag in from one position to the next is always not optimal. Uh, um, not optimal. However, we tested this and we saw that um, there is no negative effect when inhibitor is dragged in into the electrolyte. Thank you. Um, does the inhibitor affect stripping of uh, zinc coatings when reworked through the pickling bath? Um, no. So when we are stripping zinc parts, um, there is no influence of the inhibitor on the performance. Um, the next question, uh, is there extensive foaming when stripping zinc layers? Um, yeah, so as I um, said during the summary, this product is a formulation which is non-wetted. So um, when the pickling bath with Uniclean 511 is in contact with the zinc layers, um, for sure we have strong gas formation because the zinc layer is dissolved, but um, there is no extensive foaming. There's is building up a very small, uh, as I would say, it foam carpet, but this really um, goes away very, very fast. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. Uh, is the inhibitor compatible with other pickling additives uh, uh, such as uh, water or accelerator? Um, yes, so in general, these uh, different products are compatible. However, um, you have to be aware that when, for example, you add a compound which uh, accelerates the pickling, this does also affect the performance of the inhibition of Uniclean 511 but mix it, it is mixable. Okay. It is, um, is it possible to use premixes with uh, concentrated uh, uh, HCl? Um, yeah, so actually this is done by uh, a lot of customers already that they premix more concentrate, concentrated hydrochloric acid uh, with higher amounts of Uniclean 511. So premixes are possible, but there are limits. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's, uh, um, has the inhibitor to be replenished uh, separately from the acid? Um, so in general, when we, the, the normal bath um, replenishment, when you check the, the acid power of the uh, pickling bath, it uh, should be enough so the pickling inhibitor can be re replenished together in the same ratio. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. We are running out of time. I uh, um, come to the last question. Um, can the inhibitor be used uh, with sulfuric acid pickling bath? Um, Yes, thank you. Great, uh, great question and a uh, simple and quick answer. Uh, yes, it can be used with sulfuric acid again uh, as well. Thank you very much, Bjorn. There is only one thing left to say. Thank you very much. Stay healthy and safe and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.